The first technique is the seated, forward-leaning thoracic spine articulator. The subject sits facing the physician. The thoracic spinous processes are identified. Contact is on the transverse process of a spinal segment or on the costotransverse junction. The force exerted by the physician is in the anterior direction with rotation and or side bending added to approach the restrictive barrier. The subject crosses her arms and rests them on the physician's upper chest and then lays her head onto her crossed arms. The physician braces her anterior knee against the subject's knee to stabilize the subject on the table. The physician then reaches around behind the subject and makes the contact as described. The subject is then drawn forward into extension, rotation, and side bending to the restrictive barrier and low velocity, medium amplitude springing is applied until an improvement in motion is felt. Treatment is applied to the entire thoracic spine focusing on rib and or segmental motion. An alternate position is to approach the subject from the side and using the same contact on the transverse or costotransverse junction, an anterior springing is applied. A second alternate position is with the subject's arms straight and placed over the physician's shoulder. Again, contact is in the same location and the physician's knee is used to brace the subject's knee to stabilize her on the table. The next technique is cervical soft tissue. The subject lays supine with the physician at the head of the bed. The medial aspect of the cervical paraspinal muscles is contacted. The physician draws the tissue anteriorly in a kneading fashion, moving up or down the cervical spine until all tissues have been treated. This is continued until the relaxation of the tissues is palpated. Afterwards, the physician rechecks the area to make sure that all significant soft tissue somatic dysfunctions have been treated. An alternate position is from the subject's side with one side being treated at a time. The cephalad hand of the physician is placed on the subject's head for stabilization as the kneading motion is applied. After one side is treated, the physician will go to the other side to treat the remaining side until both sides and all tissues have been treated. Occipital atlantal decompression. For this technique, the contact is on the occiput as close to the condyles as possible with the middle two or three fingers of both of the physician's hands. Tension is applied with the fingertips in a vector that aims towards the subject's orbits. The amount of pressure is gauged by the response of the tissues. Pressure gradually increases as the tissues relax. Traction is created between the fingers by moving the physician's elbows medially, which levers the fingertips laterally. Respiratory assistance in either inhalation or exhalation may be used to enhance the release. This position is held until a release is felt and motion is improved, usually a minimum of 20 to 30 seconds. Then the area is reassessed to ensure that the most significant somatic dysfunctions have been addressed. Thoracic Inlet Myofascial Release. For this technique, the anterior contact is across the sternoclavicular junction and the first and second ribs. Posterior contact is across T1 and 2 and the costovertebral junction. Layer palpation is used to contact Sibson's fascia across the thoracic inlet with a broad contact of both hands. Rotation is assessed with side bending and flexion extension. All three planes are used to approach the barrier, either direct or the position of ease, indirect, to reach a point of balance. This position is held for 20 to 60 seconds until tissue creep indicates a release of the tissue tension. Then the area is reassessed to ensure that the most significant somatic dysfunctions have been addressed. An alternate position is from the side.
the contacts and motion are the same with the posterior contact mirroring the anterior hand. Lateral recumbent scapulothoracic myofascial release. Part one, the subject lays on her side facing the physician. The subject's arm is placed over the physician's caudad arm. Contact is on the superior and inferior medial angles of the scapula. The hand on the superior aspect of the shoulder initiates a rhythmic circular motion while the inferior hand contacts the muscles along the medial border. The scapula is carried laterally in a rhythmical fashion to release the muscular attachments of the rhomboids and paraspinal muscles. Fascial restrictions can then be assessed in a superior inferior, medial lateral, and rotatory motion. Scapula can then be taken either directly or indirectly to a balance point and held for 20 to 60 seconds until a release is palpated. Then the region is reassessed to ensure that the most significant somatic dysfunctions have been addressed. Part two, the subject's arm is moved to drape over the physician's cephalad arm. Contact is a broad contact over the superior aspect of the shoulder with the caudad's hands, thenar eminence, engaged in the posterior axillary fold. The hand on the superior aspect of the shoulder again initiates a rhythmic circular motion while the inferior hand contacts the muscles along the posterior axillary fold. Tissue texture is assessed and a compressive force is applied into the axillary and subscapular tissues in a rhythmical fashion along with the circular motion of the shoulder until a change in tissue texture is felt. Then the area is reassessed. Lateral recumbent lumbosacral soft tissue. The subject is still on her side with her hips and knees flexed to the point of motion in the lumbar area. Then the top leg remains bent while the bottom leg is straightened. The subject's bottom arm is grasped and pulled to rotate or twist her lumbar spine. The physician's arms are braced on the subject's axilla and iliac crest. Hand contact is the medial aspect of the lumbar or up to the lower thoracic paraspinal muscles. Three motions are then applied in a rhythmic fashion. The physician's arms carry the subject's arms and ilia apart to stretch and side bend the lumbar area. The physician's arms twist to push the subject's shoulder posteriorly and her iliac crest anteriorly. Lastly, the physician's hands contact the paraspinal muscles to stretch them laterally or bowstring them. All three of these motions are then combined and applied in a rhythmic fashion and repeated to a softening of the muscles, moving up or down the lumbar spine until all tissues have been treated. Then the area is reassessed. Supine diaphragm release. The contact for this technique is a broad contact across the lower six ribs with fingers spread over the lower ribs laterally. Layer palpation is used to contact the diaphragmatic tissues. Rotation, side bending, and flexion extension are all assessed with both hands. Then all three planes are used to approach the barrier, direct, or the position of ease, indirect. This position is held for 20 to 60 seconds or until a release is felt. Then the area is reassessed. An alternate position is a lateral approach with one hand just below the xiphoid process and the posterior hand bridging the thoracolumbar junction. The motion of both hands is used to assess the diaphragmatic motion and apply the treatment. Anterior-posterior pelvic unwinding. The posterior contact for this technique is low on the sacrum and coccyx with the fingers towards the contralateral ischial tuberosity. The anterior contact is across and slightly above the pubic symphysis. On the skeleton, the landmarks to identify 
are the PSISs, the ischial tuberosities, and the coccyx. The posterior hand bridges between the ischial tuberosities with the coccyx at the edge of the metacarpal phalangeal joint. The anterior hand is used to locate the pubic symphysis and then placed either just above or bridging across the symphysis. Layer palpation is used to assess the pelvic diaphragmatic tissues with rotation, side bending, and flexion extension all being assessed. All three planes are used to approach the barrier direct or the position of ease indirect and the position is held until a release is felt, usually at least 20 to 30 seconds. Then the area is reassessed. The pelvic compression test. In the PROMOTE study, the only purely diagnostic technique that was used was the pelvic compression test. This test is used to assess sacroiliac motion and restriction. The landmarks to locate are the ASISs, the anterior superior iliac spines. The heels of both hands are placed on the ASISs and an alternating force is directed posteriorly through the ASISs to rock the ilia on the sacrum. The more dysfunctional side will feel harder with less motion. The first technique to treat SI dysfunction is the SI articulation. This technique is done on both sides. Contact is on the subject's flexed knee and hip with mild compression to engage the femur into the acetabulum. The hip is externally rotated and circumducted into a straightened position, maintaining compression throughout the motion. The hip is then flexed and internally rotated and circumducted into a straightened position, again maintaining compression throughout the motion. This is repeated in internal and external rotation an average of four to five times. Then the technique is repeated on the opposite side of the patient's body. After both sides have been treated, the pelvis is reassessed with the pelvic compression test. Frog leg sacral articulation. The subject is supine with her hips and knees flexed and feet together. The contact for this technique is on the sacrum with the fingers at the base and the palm at the apex. When the hand is in the proper position, motion testing is performed, testing flexion and extension and also side-to-side -side motion to evaluate the SI joint. The treatment position is to hold the sacrum in a position of balance in all planes. The sacrum is taken to the point of ligamentous balance with respiratory assistance. As the subject holds her breath in the most useful phase, she lets her knees fall to the sides and straightens out her legs to rotate the anominates on the sacrum. As the subject's legs straighten, the physician exerts an inferior traction force to articulate the sacrum. This technique is usually repeated three to five times until sacral motion testing reveals significantly more symmetrical motion. Then the pelvis and SI joints are reassessed using the pelvic compression technique.
if the pelvic compression test and or landmark examination still reveals an anominate dysfunction, the muscle energy techniques can then be applied. Posterior anominate muscle energy. The leg on the side of the posteriorly rotated anominate is extended off the side of the table. The physician's contact is on the ipsilateral thigh and the contralateral ASIS. The subject's thigh is extended to a restrictive barrier of the anominates. The subject's effort is then to pull the knee towards the ceiling for three to five seconds. After relaxation, the anominate is taken to a new barrier and the force is repeated three to five times. Afterwards, the subject's leg is returned onto the table to neutral and the anominates are reassessed. Anterior anominate muscle energy. For this technique, the leg on the side of the anteriorly rotated anominate is flexed at the knee and hip. The contact is on the ipsilateral PSIS and ischial tuberosity with the subject's knee resting against the physician's chest. The leg and hip is flexed to the restrictive barrier of the anominates. Then the subject's effort is to push her knee against the physician's chest for three to five seconds. After relaxation, the anominate is taken to a new barrier and the force is repeated three to five times. The subject's leg is then returned to neutral and the anominates are reassessed using the pelvic compression test. Pubic decompression. The subject's hips and knees are flexed with the feet together. The physician hugs the subject's knees together and the subject attempts to pull them apart for three to five seconds while the physician provides the isometric counterforce. The subject ceases force and the knees are rocked side to side three times. These steps are repeated two more times. Then the subject's knees are spread apart to fist width and the subject attempts to pull them together for three to five seconds while the physician provides counterforce or blocks the subject's knees with their fist. The subject ceases the force and the knees are rocked side to side three times. The knees are then spread to a two fist width and these steps are repeated. The knees are then spread to a forearm width and the steps are repeated. Afterwards, the pelvis is reassessed.